So are jazz listeners really more open-minded than fans of classic rock? Researchers at McMaster University seem to think so, and they have the data to prove it. Joining us now to shed light on this research is Matthew Woolhouse, Assistant Professor of Music Cognition and Music Theory at Hamilton's McMaster. Hello, welcome to the program. Hi, nice to be here. Okay, I, I, I don't want to start off on the wrong foot, and I don't want to date you in any way, Matthew, but um, we're going to be talking about downloading music, but you, you I mean, this is a recent phenomenon for both of us, but you're a guy who started in the record days. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, my, my own musical upbringing, uh, my, obviously my big influences came from my parents, and they were really interested in classical music, and my mum put me in the local church choir, uh, but there's always that subversive element in my musical upbringing, which was British glam rock of the 70s. So I'm really interested in uh, Genesis. They're just a fantastic band, yes. Um, Deep Purple, uh, Pink rock. Floyd. Prog rock, it's just, uh, and you know, if I, uh, Friday afternoon, if we need to relax in the lab at, at work, that's the music that I will go to. And it's the music of my formative years, mm. and that's a really important aspect of, of being. We're gonna talk about that, because you have sure. da data to show uh, that what we listen to at a certain point in our life sort of exists uh, forever and ever. We'll talk about that, but okay, so you grew up in the record culture, you, you adapt and evolve like the rest of us through yeah. the rest of things. So what got you interested in downloading, seeing people's habits? Yeah, well, it was sort of out of the blue. I was a, a research fellow at the University of Cambridge in the UK, and I got a phone call from uh, a company called Nokia. And uh, when you get a phone call from a company like Nokia, you, you pick up and you, and, you, and you sort of follow it through. And they wanted someone with a music psychology background to look at their download data, because they've got marketing people, they've got mathematicians who are looking at it, and they were extracting certain patterns from it, but they didn't have anyone with sort of more cultural insights, uh, sort of social psychology insights into their music download data. So they asked me, and I said, OK, yeah, sure, because normally these data remain hidden from view. You know, it's a private corporation, and corporations like to look after their data because it's knowledge and power and potential profit. So I said, yeah, and I started looking at and finding things like musical adventurousness. So which country is more musically adventurous than, than another country? And can you uh, look at the, the download profile, the, the music consumption profile of a country, and maybe map that onto personality studies to show the national character mm. of the country and all that sort of stuff? So they thought, oh, this is really interesting. And uh, uh, you know, they, they published those results, and, and we, we, got, we put, generated a bit of publicity out of it, and they thought, yeah, this, is, this could be something that we want to take further. So in 2012, uh, when I became a prof at uh, McMaster University, uh, they said, okay, let's, let's uh, expand this, have all of our music download data, and uh, set up a lab, uh, apply for grants, and I was thinking, yeah, this is great possibilities here. And so that's when we signed a data sharing and cooperation agreement between myself, McMaster University, and uh, what became Mix Radio, because Mix Radio spun off from Nokia and is now a, a subsidiary company uh, that, is, that provides uh, sort of uh, music streaming services all over the world. So they have a vast amount of data. Mm. And just to give a sort of uh, mention a few numbers, in our current database, we have about 1.4 billion music downloads. 1.4 so billion? 1.4 billion downloads. So this is uh, music downloaded by people onto their mobile phones from all over the world. Illegal or illegally? This is all entirely legal. And the interesting thing about mixed radio is that you can download as much music onto your phone for free. So you're not constrained by cost. So this is a really good reflection of genuine music interests that people have. Uh, so from, from that, and now we, we think that probably this database, this 1.4 billion down, downloads, is the largest commercially generated uh, music consumption database within academia anywhere in the world. Mm. So it's a, it's a unique record of the globalization of music, the crucial time when the world is globalizing, and also the digitization of music as well, this, this important transition where everything is becoming mobile and the whole world is sitting on your phone. Yeah, we're all phone. putting music on our phone. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Matthew, so you're doing this thing with mixed radio, collaboration. What about, like, when you think, of, when I think of downloading music, I, Apple is sort of, you know, the giants, Apple and Google. Do they have interest in looking at this kind of data? They, they look after their data very, very carefully, so they don't release it uh, en masse to academia. And that's, that's what's unique about this agreement. And it allows us to really plot the, the course and the development of the emergence, for example, of new styles of music 
uh, the way in which a country can be influenced by musical styles from outside itself and that sort of thing. So uh, this is a really unique opportunity. It's also unique in that uh, students who come and work in the lab, and these are students from different faculties across the university, so they might be computer science students from engineering, they might be psychology students from the faculty of science, or they might be, of course, music students from the humanities faculty. They learn about data, and it's very, very important for students to become, or for generally for people to become savvy about data. Uh, I, I think of it as a sort of data democratization process. So students who come into the lab, they learn about database science, and they learn how to organize data into, different, into what we call a relational database management system. <laughs> and, then, and then that allows them to extract an, uh, information from the data and to ask intelligent questions of it. And that's, uh, you know, in, the, in a world of increasing data, and it's, it's not going away, mm. it's going to get larger. And also at a time when people are becoming increasingly concerned about big data and about what it says about them, it's important to have people who are trained in databases and database science who know about it. So these skills, although they're, they're honed on a music database, they're transferable. Okay. So you can transfer them. Students working in the lab can go out and get a skill uh, got a job in a company. All companies have databases now. They need to know about their, their workforce. They need to know about their, their, their clients. And they need people who can organize that data. And so it's a very useful gener generic skill mm. uh, for students to have. And as you study this scientifically, you're studying science, uh, music scientifically. How do, you, how do you do that? Like, you've got this database of 1.4 billion downloads. You don't know who I am and what I'm downloading. You don't know anything personally about me. That's right. What are you looking at? Yeah, so the, um, the data are anonymized. So the user IDs, we can't go and, and look someone up and, and knock on their door and say, you know, why have you been listening to, to, to Madonna or something like that, rather than Rush? You know, or you know we can't do that. And, and that's very important that the, the data can't be reverse engineered back to individuals, uh, because that gets into all sorts of privacy, privacy areas. So, we, so the data are aggregated, and we look at broad scale patterns and, and movements. So that's, that's really what we're going for. And, and one of the things that we've been interested, because the data are anonymized, we've been interested to try to work out the ages of people based on what they're listening to. Mm. So uh, there's a, a phenomenon called the reminiscence bump. And the reminiscence bump is basically that we are uh, very sensitive and, and, and it, we, we have a very strong memory for things that happened to us in our formative years, primarily between the ages of 15 to 20. And uh, this is particularly true for music. So the music that you listen to between the ages of 15 and 20, you uh, remember very, very, you have a close relationship to it. So if, you, in, you know, in your 40s or your 50s, you're asked just to randomly recall songs mm. from any time at all, uh, people predominantly will go back to the music they were listening to in this period. So imagine you've got a mobile phone and you say, right, I want to download some music. So you can search through 30 million songs. So you go to genres, then you go to artists, and then you go to individual songs. What people are doing there is a process of recollection. And the songs that they're recalling are from this reminiscence bump period, from usually from the ages of 15 to 20. And from that, we can infer a date of birth. So it's a very useful way of getting a, a, some sort of a, angle on, on who these people are within this database. Okay, let me throw this out. You, if I said, if you asked me to, to, to make a recollection of a song, I would probably say to you, New Order. What would, you, would that give you some information? You're about 21, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be able to, infer, you, I mean, yeah, deduce you, from that about yeah, how old I am. Yeah. Should, should, should be able to. In ask. other words, <laughs> <I'm not asking. laughs> and, the, and, and, the, and the other thing is that, I mean, this is, this is music that, you, that people use to form an identity, to express themselves. It's this important threshold period when they're leaving the home and they're going out into the big wide world and they use music and not just music, they also form their political ideas at this, this, mm -hmm. this time, they make lifelong friends at this time. Um, so so it, it's a way of forming your identity and music is very sticky. So the music that we listen to during this period, we tend to stay loyal to throughout the course of our lives. Yeah, I read something recently, you know, a, a study that said basically people over you know, the age of 35 or something aren't you know, as apt to 
try out new music, especially people with or people with kids are more apt to because their kids introduce it. Basically, we're set in our ways once we get to a certain point, for the most yeah, part. Yeah, of course, when you've got kids, there's a, there's a negotiation going on there, and it usually happens in the car. You know, the kid wants a certain radio station on, and, and because you're in a confined space and you have to share the music that is being played. Uh, and so I, this happens to me, you know, I'm, I'm in the car and I'm, I, I constantly want to go to a radio station that might be playing uh, Bob Dylan or, or, or Genesis or classical music, because mm. I absolutely love classical music. But uh, my kids are in, obviously into uh, pop music and, you know, the, what's, what's hot now. So right, Megan Trainor, Taylor Swift, all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I know. I know of this stuff. Um, so we talk about you. you Why? Well, Taylor Swift, for example, why is Shake It Off so popular? Why do people like it? It's because people say it's got this catchy, yeah. infectious sort of line to it. Yeah, it's, sure. What so, makes, is, is that true? I mean, are we, what does the data tell you about why certain songs are catchy or infectious or why we're drawn to them? Okay, so the, the data certainly tell us that songs, some songs are definitely infectious and very catchy. And we can actually use uh, models of infection, the spread of infectious diseases. Really? Uh, to, to study uh, how songs become popular and how long they remain infectious and how typically uh, an individual who is infected with a song, how many people that person uh, actually infects with the song. So yeah, there's a very interesting math prof at McMaster called uh, Dr. David Earn, and we have a, a collaboration with him in the lab and he's, he's got a, a super bright uh, master's degree student and she's doing a project she's called Dora. She's doing a wonderful project where she's actually taking individual songs and looking at the growth of the popularity of that song and then modeling that growth using epidemic models. And from that, we can see that rock songs, for example, stay infectious for, for much longer than pop songs. So rock songs. Yeah, okay. so a typical rock song, someone who's infected with a rock song, they will remain infected with it. Uh, it will remain sort of stuck to them in, 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 so in terms of its popularity for much, typically much longer than, than a pop song. And then you'll have a soul song. Uh, and soul songs are interesting because they, they tend to infect a lot of people. So someone who's infected with a soul song, they may not be infected for very long, but they will pass it on mm. to a lot of other people. So you can use these sort of interesting, complex m mathematical models to actually study song popularity. I mentioned in the intro jazz. Where does that fit in? Uh, jazz, well, I think that the original question was, what makes a catchy song? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the best answer to that is that hit song science is not a science. Um, it's, it's too complex. There are two, unfortunately, there are, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which way you look at it, there are too many things uh, which uh, give rise to why a song is popular. There are musical things. so. Uh, things to do with the melody, things yeah, inside the music itself. And there are a bunch of extra musical things. Uh, so the timing has to be right. The whole look and feel, the subculture that that mm. song exists in ha has to be right for it to go viral. Um, so there are people who, so, so music's a very interesting, in terms of information, it's really interesting. So you've got this thing called metadata. Metadata are things like, you know, when the song was released, uh, maybe who downloaded the song, I, the, uh, the, the, the country in which that person was living, uh, you know, the artist, the genre, those are sort of what we call the metadata. But then there's sort of like microdata associated with a song. And that is the acoustic features of the song. And you can extract there are algorithms which, which will listen to a song, machine, mm. what are called machine learning algorithms, and they will listen to the song and they'll extract all these audio features. And then you, you'll have a series of parameters and all of these numbers will change. And then you might take a Katy Perry song and you say, well, okay, what's the, the, what's the magic mix of acoustic features? And you say, great, we've, we've got the, the perfect formula. We've got the fingerprint of a great song here. And then you go say, right, let's go to our database and let's try and match all these audio features to some other song some in, in the database. And then you go to and you can find the closest match. You say, like, there's like a 95 match with, percent match with another song. And you go, well, what is this other song that it's matched to? A totally unknown song mm. by an unknown so artist. It's 5% magic. That, so that in, a, in a sense, what we're missing here is, is some other unique combination which is very, very unpredictable. Mm. And uh, 
In a way, long may that remain the case. Yeah, I mean, it, it would it's, take it's, away, if we could deduce this all to science, we'd right. lo lose the magic of, of yeah, creativity. Yeah, I mean, music, is, music uh, is not a science. It can be studied scientifically, but itself mm. is not a science. And that's slightly difficult for scientists sometimes to get their head around. You know, you're, you're a Genesis guy. Um, you like certain genres of music. Everyone does, whether it's rap or jazz. You, you found that there is a link between the genres that we like and our personalities. So what is that link? That's right. Well, this is so you imagine you've got this database and we, we don't know who the users are in it. And so how can you possibly link that to personality? Well, we do that through uh, existing music personality studies. So just to take a step back, over the course of the past 25 years, a lot of studies have been done linking styles of music to personality. So uh, the way psychologists think about personality uh, they have these different factors. So they have factors like openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And they then associate certain styles of music through perfectly legitimate, legitimate statistical means. They uh, associate these different styles of music with these different personality traits. So for example, uh, if you're open, uh, you people who like jazz and blues music tend to have more open type personality. That's op that by open, I mean uh, open to new experiences, okay. willing to accept difference. So people who have... Open-minded. Open-minded. People who have those qualities, tend, uh, or like jazz, tend to have those personality qualities. Okay. Um, in, this, in the case of uh, something like um, conscientiousness, soul and funk are closely associated with a high degree of conscientiousness. Uh, extroversion, pop and rap. Um, agreeableness, so how friendly you are, that will be associated with uh, a genre like easy listening or musical soundtracks to movies and stuff. So it makes sense stuff. as you sort of spell it out, right? Because easy listening is pretty agreeable. Of course, there's a, there's a, there's a huge amount of variance around, around this. So neuroticism. Uh, which is a sort of emotional instability, uh, measure of emotional instability or um, uh, sort of moodiness that can be associated with dance music. Mm. So there are these ex uh, sort of existing mappings between music on the one hand and then uh, personality dimensions on the other. And so we've been particularly interested in openness, this idea that, uh, you know, maybe if you have an open personality, uh, you will be interested in more different types of music. So what we do is we take our database <clears throat> and we, uh, we separate the users out into different groups. So we will have, and we call these groups X heads. And the X stands for a certain style of music. So you can have jazz heads, you can have rock heads, pop heads, whatever. And then we know there's a strong association between, in, the, in this pre-existing studies, between jazz and openness. So we find all the jazz heads and we say, if this association is right, mm then the jazz heads in our database should not just be listening to jazz, but they should theoretically be listening to lots of diverse genres. And that's exactly what we find. So we find this, what we can do is we can take these pre-existing music personality studies, we can actually apply it to the database and find sort of a verification of these studies through the listening habits of the people based on what is their main genre that, that mm. is that they're consuming, whether it's jazz or blues or rock or pop or indie, okay, whatever what, it might be. What genre is not very um, <clears throat> laudable, if I can put it that way? Laudable, I think there's, there's no, no non-laudable uh, genre. Um, there, are, there are genres which are associated with aggression mm. more, and there are those associated with being gentle. And one of the things which might surprise people is that studies show that uh, metal is, associated, is actually associated with gentleness. Like heavy metal? Heavy metal. Heavy metal is a completely different genre from rock. Rock is actually associated with, with aggression, huh. whereas heavy metal is associated with people who are actually quite gentle. It's almost as if they have, people who are listening to heavy metal have a, like an alter ego. Right. I want to ask you about a Canadian band, Rush. You know mm -hmm. Rush, you're familiar with Rush. Um, how do Rush fans feel about other genres of music? Yeah, so Rush fans, so... Because you looked at this specifically. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we've looked at Rush. I mean, for a number <laughs> of reasons, I like Rush for a start. So uh, that's, a good, that's always a good starting point. But, but more than me, I have students working in the lab, a couple of really, really bright students, one called Jyoti, the other called James, uh, who are massive Rush fans. So 
uh, one summer we had a bit of downtime and we thought, well, wouldn't it be a lot of fun to go into the database and look at Rush fans all over the world and do a sort of analysis of them. Where do they live? In which countries do, they, you know, do we find Rush fans? Obviously, we're going to find some in North America and Europe. But where else? Do, do we find them in South America and all that sort of stuff? And also, what else are Rush fans listening to? Are Rush fans nostalgic? Do they tend mm. to listen to older music and so on and so forth? So uh, they did that. And, and one of the things we were really interested in was, you know, what, what else are Rush fans listening to? Because Russia's music is very sophisticated. It's a, it's a fantastically sophisticated form of rock. It's got really complex time signatures, wonderful melodies. Uh, it, it's what we call contrapuntal music. So it's got lots of things interweaving, and uh, it's not just chords going round and round. They, these, these guys are, mm. are magicians. They really know what they're doing. So we thought, because it's so sophisticated, Will this translate into interest in other sophisticated genres? And by that, I mean classical music. Sure. Because it's got lots of interesting patterns within it. And also jazz. It can be very sophisticated. And uh, so they, the Jyoti and James did this study and uh, found this extremely clear um, effect for Rush fans of interest in sophisticated genres compared to normal listeners. So that was one aspect of the study. The other aspect is where, where do um, Rush fans live? Well, mm. there's a huge contingent of Rush fans in Brazil. In Brazil? In Brazil, in South America. In fact, we, we were finding some really interesting stuff, so interesting that we thought, well, maybe we should contact uh, Russia's management team mm. and tell them about this. This sort of like, the database gives us this bird's eye view on fans and their inner musical lives all over the world. And so we contacted Anthem Records, and then representatives from An Anthem Records came over to the lab, and Jyoti and James gave this great presentation and showed them all this stuff, and they were absolutely fascinated by it. Uh, unfortunately, Rush didn't come, or they haven't come yet, right. but at least their, their management team came. Well, and, and so why are they big in Brazil? Did you, did you figure that out in any kind of scientific think, way? Yeah, I mean, Brazilian music, I mean, the Brazil, Brazilian music scene, cultural scene is, is very, very diverse very, very complex. Uh, it's a post-colonial country. If you compare, I mean, a lot of people think of Britain as being a very, you know, strong musically, and we've obviously producing the Beatles and Genesis. Uh, you know, so, so it's, got, it's got lots of, um, it's got a good, strong musical tradition. But actually, Brazil is much, much more diverse. And uh, it's got, you know, very, very committed rock fans, very committed indie fans, very, very committed soul fans. Uh, in, in, in equal proportion. So if you, if you look at the musical diversity of, of Brazil, it's way, way greater. And, it's, and it's that musical diversity is a, is a form of sophistication. Mm. And therefore Rush, with its sophisticated musical constructions and, and songs, really fits in with that musical culture of sophistication. Okay, well, because I think we have a graph that shows some data by country by country that, that you could talk about. I mean, what are we learning about why, I, I, I hear the Brazil example, but why a certain band um, becomes popular in a certain culture? What can we extrapolate from your, from your data? Um, why a band becomes popular? Obviously, there's, there, are, there are language things. Uh, but again, uh, Pierce, one of those issues is a, a little bit like what makes a hit song. You know. We, we don't know why. I mean, if we knew, I, I, you know, I'd be, if I yeah, knew, you'd be a gazillionaire. I'd be, I'd be, you'd be a music I'd, producer. I'd be I get really, it. I'd be a really, really rich guy. Yeah. Um, so there are lots of different factors, and they may be, for example, to do with secondary artists. So the producer, the effect of a producer uh, has can, can, can radically transform a band. So one of the things that we're, we're interested in doing with the database that we have, we have all this metadata in it, and we, we have the microdata mm. as well associated with the, with the audio signals of each of the individual songs. But we're really interested in the, the people very often that are behind the bands, the engineers and the producers. A good example of this is a, is a British band from the 80s called Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Know them, yes. That were sort of bumbling along, second sort of degree band, and, and they weren't really making the big time. They got associated with Trevor Horn, and he just, as a producer, he just transformed them and did you know, miraculous things with them. They became this global phenomenon. So people, the secondary artists, do play a, a key part in this. We call, we call this the atomic person mm. table. So we, we have all these bands, and if you think about a band, it's an aggregate of lots of individuals, you know, uh, and Really, it's the people behind the band, the individual members and the influence that they bring on to, to bear, which can give you, can create stronger predictive models. 
because it's all about prediction. You, you know, we, we, we want to predict which band is going to become popular uh, in China, for example. And there are a bunch of ways that we can do it. We can look at the audio features, but it might also be lyric content. You know, so we might want to think, OK, so we, we really need to look at the lyrics and the sentiment of the lyrics. And we know that in the past, lyrics with these sentiments have been hits. So we go to our database, we find, uh, we do the lyric analysis, and we find a song, yeah, that's, that song has got all the sentiments that we need. Um, it may or may not be a hit. We think, we, you know, there's a possibility, there's a probability, of say, maybe only 50, 60% probability. If, we, if, if that gets promoted within a service, gets promoted on playlists, then that might become a hit. It's a complex, very, very complex question. You know, we were talking about breaking down music scientifically and through, through data. And I, and we have to round out our conversation, but um, I, 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 does doing all this sort of sap the fun out of music, when we break down artistry and creativity um, on data and science and saying, well, we, can, we know what's going to be successful because we know the ingredients that we need to be put in. Are we taking a bit of the magic out of all of this? It's a good question. I, I think the, probably the best people to answer that are the students who work in the lab. So I, I, I have a lot of kids at Mac, very, very bright. I get a good pick of the brightest and the best. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's because music is just is, is a fascinating thing. They're learning great skills, just da data handling skills, data science skills, programming skills. Um, but also there's this fascination with music. We have a really deep personal relationship with music. And to start to peel away some of the layers and understand some of the trends, I think is uh, an endless source of fascination. With a database the size that we have, uh, I liken it to an ocean, like it's an ocean of data. And at the start of every week, we have this meeting in the lab, and we, we do like, who's doing what, and which projects are progressing, and stuff like that. So we have this stand up where we're, we're really discussing stuff. And it's a bit like launching your ship into the ocean of data. And you cast your net, and you catch some stuff, and you pull it in, and you find out what you've catch, and you think, OK, based on what we've caught, we're going to go off in that direction. You're never quite sure where you're going to go, because there's so much variability, so much rich cultural musical information in there that it's a never-ending task, uh, but it's one which is constantly fascinating and mm. constantly challenging. Despite being a Yes fan, it was a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. You're welcome. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.